With the experience and resources for cases throughout Louisiana, Walters Papillon Thomas Collins LLC is proud to support LPB, specializing in personal injury and wrongful death, with information at lawbr.net. Hello everyone, I'm Natasha Williams on behalf of Louisiana Public Broadcasting. I would like to welcome you all here this evening and thank you so very much for coming. We'd also like to thank the wonderful staff here at the East Baton Rouge Parish Library for allowing us to meet here and making all of us feel so welcome. We're here tonight thanks to the generous support of the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and the show Finding Your Roots with Henry Louis Gates Jr. LPB is very proud to bring this hit show to all the people of Louisiana. So let's begin tonight by taking a look back at season, or taking a look at season six, Finding Your Roots, which is now airing on Tuesdays at 7 p.m. on LPB. So we just saw the short clip. Estepatha Murkison discovered a piece of Louisiana history that not everyone is familiar with, a part of history that we are here tonight to explore. Our goals for tonight are to explain just who are the GU-272 and their connection to Louisiana, and to help you determine if you might actually be a descendant of those enslaved people. We are also here going to talk about the important role the public library plays in research and about the resources that are available. To do that, let's welcome our panel. Karen Royal is the executive director of the GU-272 Descendant Association, Descendants Association. She's gonna be joining us right here. We have David Lotch. He's a genealogy librarian with the East Baton Rouge Parish Library. And we also have Judy Riffle. She's a Baton Rouge genealogist with the Georgetown Memory Project to talk about their role in this fascinating story. Thank you all for being here tonight and for taking part in our community discussion. So Karen, we're starting with you. Hopefully you'll be able to help us fill some of the historical blanks, some of the gaps. So thanks to the clip, we know that the Jesuit priest that ran Georgetown University sold 272, but we actually know it's 314, yes. right? Yes, yes. 314 enslaved people to Catholic plantation owners here in Louisiana. What we didn't hear in that clip is why that decision was made. So share with us. So at the time, the Jesuits were having financial problems. Georgetown University was in debt, and they needed a way to make money to continue to uh, forge ahead with cement and Catholicism in the Maryland province. And so they sold uh, some of their enslaved people to two men in Louisiana, as you did here in the clip. Okay. And when they were brought here, they were uh, placed on plantations in Iberville, Ascension, and Terrebonne Parish. Mm -hmm. So we know, again, that, as you said, they were placed in Iberville, Ascension, and Terrebonne Parishes. Um, Judy, you're the genealogist with the Georgetown Memory Project. How about you um, tell us what that organization's role is and what you have to do with all of this? Okay, well, the Georgetown Memory Project is an independent nonprofit organization that was founded in the fall of 2015 by Richard Cellini, who is a Georgetown alum. And he asked the question, well, what happened to these 272 people? And no one seemed to have an answer, so he set out to try to get an answer for that. And he started Googling, and he found uh, Patricia Bayonne Johnson, who is a descendant of the Butler family. And she had hired me as a professional genealogist a dozen years or more ago. And I had found some documents in the Iberville Parish Courthouse that listed her ancestors, uh, Nace and Bibby Butler. And she, uh, I didn't know the connection to Georgetown University at that time, but she researched it and she made the connection with the Jesuits and she had blogged about it and Richard found her blog online and she had mentioned my name, so he contacted me and after some discussions, uh, he hired me to see if I could trace all 272 of them. So I set out on that in the fall of 2015 and here we are um, 
four and a half years later, <laughs> and uh, we've we've made quite a bit of progress. We've um, we've we've hired a, other genealogists too. Um, I have a counterpart in Maryland who is tracing the descendants who remained because not all of them ended up being sent to Louisiana. Mm -hmm. So uh, she's tracing them. Uh, we've identified, like you said, 314. The 272 sort of grew to 314. Mm -hmm. And right now we've got over 9,000 descendants. We've, uh, that's living and deceased descendants that we've traced. And we've, we've started a database online where people can access that information if they want to. Can you talk about the role DNA has played in the work? You know, I know there's a lot of great interest in that, but there's also some misconceptions associated with that as well? Yes, um, uh, we did, um, some about a year into the project, we did start using DNA. Uh, Ancestry.com um, had given us some kits, and we, um, we identified some, some people who had good paper trails, who were confirmed descendants, we knew that they were descendants, and we did their DNA. And we, we tried to pick the oldest uh, generations to test who were closer to uh, the enslaved ancestors. And we did their DNA, and um, uh, mainly just to supplement our paper trail. Uh, we, we don't use DNA when we don't have a paper trail. We, if you're missing generations, we don't assume anything. We, we just use it to back up what we've done, uh, the research that we've done. And we did find, you know, there were connections that we didn't even know about and that people are interrelated in ways we still don't know. But uh, the, the misconceptions are that DNA can tell you everything. It doesn't. It has to go with the research. And that's, uh, that's important to have that paper trail. Okay. So Karen, what is the role of the GU-272 Descendants Association? What do you guys do? Well, one of the things we do is we help reconnect our families, reunite what slavery tore apart. And um, just tonight in this room, we were doing that stitching together, that fabric of our families that have been torn apart. We have uh, held many uh, gatherings. Uh, one in each one of the parishes in Louisiana. We've held three gatherings in Maryland of descendants in a room uh, folks would come together, not unlike tonight, mm -hmm. and learn for the first time that they are related to each other. And they share family tree information. Some who've done DNA share DNA information. And they work to try to find that exact link of how they're related. And, uh, and so that's the, our main role is to help reconnect our families. The, the interesting part, I heard Judy say that there's now 9,000 descendants, deceased and some living. That number just keeps growing because I heard any, <laughs> at 6,000 at one point and then 8,000. The number keeps growing because as you knit that fabric you're talking about, you're finding more and more people. Absolutely. And, uh, I, you know, there may be some people in the room tonight that may not yet be in the database. Mm -hmm. uh, there are some folks who have known each other uh, for many years and now realizing, wait a minute, you're a butler descendant mm -hmm. and, and I'm a butler descendant. And now they can now be added to that database. And uh, yeah, that number will um, only grow. I think it's been said about 15,000 just based on what I know of family connections, I believe it's gonna go much higher than 15,000. Okay, wow. So Judy, what is the biggest, or what is a big challenge? Um, what, I, let me start over. Okay, how did the challenge of slavery, the practice of slavery, um, create problems in your research as a geologist? Well, genealogist. Researching African-American ancestors is difficult because of the slavery issue and for other reasons. Um, Louisiana has very good records though. Um, compared to most other southern states, we have uh, really good records. And um, the three parishes where the Georgetown slaves were sent were um, 
the records were fairly intact. They had, the courthouse hadn't burned. I mean, there were gaps here and there, but it, there was no big catastrophe. So we were lucky there. We also have, because they were, many of them maintained their Catholic religion, we did have some baptismal records uh, that we could access through the Catholic diocese. Um, we have, of course, I spent a lot of time in the courthouse looking up conveyance records, probate records, wills, and um, uh, other civil suits, all sorts of rec marriage records um, that uh, supplemented that research. So in, if they had been sent anywhere but Louisiana, I think we probably wouldn't be talking here today because if they had been sent, say, to Georgia where Sherman burned most of the courthouses down, you know, you wouldn't have what we have here in Louisiana. So we were, uh, we were pretty lucky um, in that. Karen, what are some of the clues that you might be a descendant of well, the GU-272? Well, one of the first clues, if you've done some research into your family history and you can trace your ancestors back to Maryland, and then if you see further down the line that they ended up in Louisiana, those would be some telltale clues. But I believe in your packet you have a listing of the surnames. Uh, if those surname ancestors you trace back to Maryland and, and may or may not have a Louisiana connection, uh, that, that's uh, one of the first clues. Of course, you have to continue to do the research and um, find that you go back to someone who may have been enslaved on a Jesuit plantation in Maryland. And they actually didn't leave because some of them ran away from what we understand or did not, were not a part of the number that came here. Absolutely. We know that uh, Louisa Mahoney and Nace Butler Jr., they were told to hide out in the woods until after the sale had occurred. And we have been in touch with our cousins from, uh, that descend from Louisa and those who descend from Nace Butler Jr. They raised families in Maryland. Mm -hmm. And um, their fam the, the larger part of their family came here to Louisiana. And it's, it's as clear as day, especially when you add DNA to the mixture. But we've actually met these cousins, and it's totally amazing. So we have handouts, and we're going to encourage everyone to make sure that on the way out, you pick out some of the handouts, handouts that we have up there for you. Um, also, uh, we also... Uh, basically have some descendants, I guess, that are here um, that uh, were on the front row and now they're not on the front row. Or they're, they're coming to the front row. <laughs> and so we'd like to give you a chance to make some comments, so we invite you. And the descendants, we'll start with um, Valerie White, um, uh, originally from Terrebonne Parish, uh, vice president of the uh, association. Um, so let's talk. Okay. Okay. Do I stand or? Okay. Thank you. I'm going to sit down. Okay. So tell me about your experience. Tell me how you got connected, how you found out. My cousin, um, Suzette Thomas, who is sort of like our family historian, she knows everything you ever want to know about our family. Um, there was an article that came out in the paper that said that they found this wonderful photograph um, at Nichols State University, and I just happened to have come home, and she shared that with me, and that was um, right around the time that uh, the big event was supposed to happen in Georgetown, bringing descendants from everywhere back together mm -hmm. to have the big apology. Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, um, uh, yeah, uh -huh. right. Well, anyway, three weeks later, I was at that event, uh -huh. so that's how I found out about it. Yep. So you found out about it, but you had to do, obviously, a lot more homework. Yes. Ever since that time, um, we've done as much as we could possibly do to bring our family together. Suzette already had the, the uh, big database of, of all of the, the family members and descendants and whatever. Well, we were trying to add to that family mm -hmm. to find more relatives to let them know. We actually brought, uh, we had a big family reunion. Of course, we used the term family reunion kind of lightly mm -hmm. because it was kind of like uh, a conference <laughs> where we explained uh, all of what was happening because it was a lot mm -hmm. to, to call somebody up and say, did you hear about this? Did you hear about that? 
We wanted everyone to have all of the information. So we had this gigantic family reunion. We had uh, family members from 11 different states come in. Wow. There was over 125 people there. And um, we had uh, Karen come in and speak, as, as, well, as well as Ms. Branch come in and speak. Um, we had a video from Richard uh, Cellini, um, and so we also had someone from New England Historical Society come and speak to us so that our family got the whole story of what happened. We shared documents. We put together um, uh, a group page on Facebook where we could share pictures, mm -hmm. and everybody started sending in pictures of, of, of their ancestors. Uh, we also use that page to disseminate information. So every time something comes up with GU 272, it gets posted okay. and it goes out to all of the family. The power of social media. Right. We even created these, uh, have a beautiful crest. crest the to Campbell keep, family. You know, yeah, the Camel family crest. So that, uh, and I know you could talk about it all night. You showed me a wonderful like layout of your. <laughs> all right, we gotta go. Okay. Yeah. yeah. All right. you, you showed me a wonderful layout of the family tree. Mm -hmm. But I mean, just final question: How do you feel to know that this man, who lived, I guess, well over a hundred, you know, yes. is so directly linked to your family tree? Well, I'm actually proud of this man. I mean, um, he, the, what he had to go through. Mm -hmm and, and, and uh, survived through. And he's the reason that we're here in Louisiana. Mm -hmm. uh, matter of fact, we recently found his home. Mm -hmm. That was, all of that is exciting, um, you know, information to us. But I'm, I'm ecstatic to be a descendant of, of Frank Campbell. Okay. Yeah. Thank okay. you for sharing your right. story. Yeah. Okay, Sherilyn Branch, she is the president of the association. And uh, we'd love to hear what you have to say, how you got started, how you came to this process. I guess you guys ran into each other. There was a story like that, something like that? I taught her. Oh, yeah, she was your She's teacher. She's a former student of mine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so good evening, everyone, and thank you guys for all of the work, and especially you, Judy, through Richard. So thank you, because many of us, like myself, were found and located because of the research that, that you did. Um, so thank you for that. So my name is Cherilyn Branch. I'm a Ford descendant. And um, I was uh, retiring from my job, long-term job, uh, in 2016 in April. Um, kept getting these calls that I was ignoring because I was leaving that place. And so finally answered and Richard Cellini informed me um, as I had to sit down that my family actually descended from slaves sold by Georgetown and that my maternal grandfather, great-grandfather, maternal great-grandfather, had been a slave um, and was sold as an infant. So that meant that his parents, his four siblings, and he was sold family package um, to Chatham Plantation in Donaldsonville in Ascension Parish. And that's what I was told. So um, CBS did a little excerpt on this same subject. Okay. Karen saw, saw it. Mm -hmm. And um, she called me and she said, I think we might be cousins. <laughs> so um, Karen and I had seen each other through work, um, her work in Orleans Parish, and um, we connected. And Karen had the wonderful idea, let's put this on Facebook. And we decided that we'd have a meeting, and we began the association. And our first meeting was April, I'm sorry, August of 2016. August okay. 14th. 14th, but that was actually the second meeting Okay, because we had a meeting before that. So that was our first official start. Mm -hmm. And so we began the association September 1st. Five members of our organization went to Georgetown to hear the public apology. Thank you for sharing. You're welcome. <laughs> Four. 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 Okay, Rochelle Sanders Prater, come share your story. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I am very excited, I'm honored, and I'm privileged to be here and to represent our family. Um, I happen to be, when I found out, uh, I actually live in Cincinnati, Ohio. I'm from Maringouin. That's home, will always be. I happen to be on a, getting on a flight going to California, and somebody had posted uh, congratulations to Maxine, uh, Maxine Crump, April 16th. I go, oh, 
Then they said uh, something about the Harkins. I'm like, wait a minute. I know she related to me through the crunk, not through the Harkins. Mm -hmm. So, but anyway, I know from doing our tree, my sister had did our tree about the Harkins. So I knew the, the name immediately. So when I got back home, I looked at the tree and I saw that Jackson, Jackson was actually my great grandfather. So it was that personal, that close. I never met him, I never knew of it, but he was three years old when the sale was made. That being said, so much, I got so much in me, y'all. Y'all just don't know, I could talk all night. We know. I'm not gonna do it, I'm not gonna do it, but I am here the rest of the month. I actually drove in from Cincinnati for this. Because I be living for them, okay? Again, I be living for them. So if y'all interested, come to Maryland to the Mighty Gras. We have a Mighty Gras parade, Mighty Gras ball. I'm here. Whatever you want to know, I'm here. Thank That's you. Good. That's great. I love the spirit. So, David, finally, I know you've been sitting there just waiting. So libraries really play a huge role. And for many people, they're looking to begin this journey. So help us, you know, tell us how you can be begin your genealogical journey. Tell us the resources that the East Baton Rouge Paris Library has to get you going. Well, first of all, the first thing I recommend is talk to your family. Talk to the old people. Ask them what they know. And then come in with that information, and then we can get you set up and get started. But the, what the library has, first of all, is uh, this library in particular has access to the Ancestry Library Edition website, where you can do a lot of searching. We also are an affiliate member of uh, Family Family Search, and these are you know huge databases with tremendous amounts of information. Um, we have a lot of family histories upstairs. We have all the Father Abra books if you're familiar with those. We have also I've I think an almost complete collection of the the red books as well. Mm -hmm. A, the uh, plantation records that pertain to Louisiana, the ones that are still existent, um, on microfilm. They're a little difficult to use. I've been promised there's an index coming out soon. It's been soon for several years now. <laughs> but we, we, we can get you set up on that. Um, and of course, we have, if you look in our book section, we have the slave narratives. Is everyone familiar with the slave narrative collection? Is that the rain? For some reason, for some reason, the Louisiana WPA records didn't get published with those, and those are at Southern University. But you know, we know where they are. Um, and also, I think the most important resource that we have to get you started and get you going in your genealogy is us, the staff. We, we know where the things are. And we can help you, we can get you started, we can get you set up, we can show you techniques. Um, we offer classes, if you look on page 13 of this month's source, those are the classes that are coming up in February. We offer about four or five classes a month and we rotate through them. Introductory classes, classes on how to use the basic databases, classes on more specific topics like how to use a census, how to find genealogical data in wills and probate records, which asks, slave descendants will be of interest to you because many times when property was probated, the slaves would have been listed as individual property by name. Um, you don't know, we don't know what we have till we start looking for it, really. There's a lot of things up there. So another so. question, you know, are these resources universal? Someone in Terrebonne Parish, can they basically access the same information as someone in EBR? Um, they'd have to come here. Um, for a lot of the time, no, we have reciprocal agreements with a lot of neighboring parishes. You'd have to check with your parish library to see. I know it's all the parishes that border East Baton Rouge Parish, but some of the um, smaller parishes will not have access to the same databases that we have or the same record sets that we have. Um, but that being said, we are constantly answering emails and phone calls from people around the state and even around the country asking for information that we can get them. Um, obituaries are a really popular one. We have access to every Baton Rouge Advocate and New Orleans Times-Picayune ever published. Mm -hmm. um, 
So yes, if you don't have what you're looking for, where you are, ask. Ask around. Send us an email. Call us up. We'll, we'll do what we can. Okay. So. Thank you very much. So Karen, I know there is a specific place not too far from here that basically will help us in this process as far as being totally dedicated to, I guess, a tribute to the GU 272. So tell us about the Finding, uh, the finding Your Roots uh, African American Museum in Homa. I went there yesterday and I must say, incredible, you must go. Yes, uh, Margie Scobie, the director mm -hmm. of the mm -hmm. Finding Your Roots African American Museum in Homa has put together an amazing GU 272 uh, exhibit. And I encourage everyone to go down there and, and, and just spend some time at the museum looking through the exhibit. Um, it's, it's very moving and um, uh, just go do it. <laughs> It, it, the exhibit is contained in one room, but it, there is so much to see. I mean, if you take the time to examine the various, the manifest, pictures of the ship, pictures of actually some of the, actually of the slaves, um, just incredible artifacts and, and copies of artifacts that actually could help you maybe in the process. Absolutely, um, and, and, and Val White, uh, whose ancestors are um, in Terrebonne Parish, can probably even add even more to this, but uh, the, when we were there in 2018, it was uh, just a huge wall, including a, a large picture of Mr. Frank Campbell. And uh, Margie has even helped some of the people in the area find that they are uh, descendants of the GU-272. I, I spoke with her today. She has helped upwards of 30 people identify themselves as being um, with Georgetown. Yes. Okay. Yeah, she's, a, she's an amazing woman, mm -hmm. and she welcomed us in um, June of 2018. We brought a busload mm -hmm. of people there, and they welcomed us with a pre-Juneteenth ceremony, mm -hmm. and that's when they revealed that one of their board members was actually a GU-272 descendant along with some of the other people in the community and, and showed us that actually that was the revamped um, display because she had already had a, a, a nice um, uh, exhibit of mm -hmm. the GU-272, but uh, she really stepped it up and, and put together a wonderful experience. And going to the museum itself is just a really wonderful experience in Louisiana history, African-American Louisiana history. And kind of, I guess, the interesting thing to me is it was an African-American high school that has now been turned into a museum. And so therefore, you know, it's, it's something that was a part of our history anyway, and now it's contain, our history is contained in it. So that's, that was really special to me. Yes. Um, David, go back to you one more time. You ready? Sure. Okay. So why do you think people are so drawn to genealogy? Well, <laughs> um, there's no one answer to that. Um, as, as was pointed out in the, the thing we watched, there's a lot of question about you know, there's an unrootedness in American, I think, in American culture. Uh, we are all, we're all immigrants here, whether willing or not. Um, and we don't know where we came from. We, you know, your parents don't talk about their parents. They don't talk about their grandparents. And I think there's a, a sense of trying to be connected to a story. And I know that's what draws me to it. That's what I find compelling. Um, but I think that's what draws a lot of people. But you know, other people have other reasons. People have some people are get into it because they want to find you know illustrious ancestors or famous people in their family tree. I don't think that's a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> they may be there, um, but yeah, I think it's mostly because of the unrootedness of a lot of American life and just a need to feel part of something bigger. Okay, Karen, tell us, you know, what is this experience? Um, to get near I was gonna tell you that I'm about two quick obvious questions. Okay, all right, we're gonna go with this last experience and uh, uh, tell me, what has this experience given you and then we'll go to audience questions. It's completely changed my life. I spend almost all of my time either uh, 
helping to reconnect people or researching, trying to find more connections, uh, posting on our Facebook page, posting on our website, um, connecting with our cousins in Maryland. Mm -hmm. Just, it's just a part of daily living. It's, it totally changed my life. And you spend hours sometimes overnight uh, well, researching. Well, well, yeah, yeah, I'm up, everybody <laughs> knows I'm up late. I'm up late on, online um, researching and connecting with people. Um, because you don't, just so you know, you don't ever finish with your tree. You never finish, you, you keep going and you keep going and um, reconnecting our families. Okay, so we have some audience questions, ma'am. I was just hoping that maybe I could get a connection. How far back have you gotten? To 1870. 18, you've gotten him on the 1870? Yes, and, and he's, he's either 48 or 58, but it shows that it lists him as from North Carolina. Have you, is he living in the Maranguin area? Oh, yes. Well, yes. there were some big plantations in that area, especially the wool folks were next door. Um, they had a big plantation. There were several other plantations in that area. If you look at a map, um, you might be able to find some. I can refer you to some maps to see what some of those plantations were in, in that specific area and start researching those owners. You want to look for probate records, conveyance records, and look for his name in there. You want to look for family groups. If he's married with ch or, or his, his wife will be listed with their children in an inventory somewhere. That's how you make that connection. Were there three major plantations that they went yes, to? Yes, they, um, they were brought to a, a plantation um, in um, Ascension Parish, which was the Chatham Plantation. Uh, they were brought to a plantation in Terrebonne Parish, but then they was further sold. And then in uh, Iberville Parish, it was West Oak Plantation, but it had several different names over time. And um, again, West, West Oaks, West Oak, or West Oaks. And did you um, identify the surnames? And, and just know, of course, in, the, in Iberville Parish, there were more than just that plantation. There were many others as well. And so, because none of those are, the, are surnames on the surname list, but uh, it would be important to narrow down um, uh, some more surnames. Maybe there's some names that you're not familiar with. And uh, of course, that's going to take the plain old research. Because if you got sold, then you got the name of the person that you were sold to, right? Not necessarily. Not necessarily. No. Not necessarily, because these ancestors came here with various surnames. Okay. Uh, because you know the Jesuits didn't give them their surnames. Mm -hmm. They uh, may have gotten their surnames from people who previously owned them, who bequeathed them, or mm -hmm. in other ways gave them to the Jesuits. Okay. So it's not necessarily that you would have the surname of your Slaveholder. Okay, that's good information. Another question? We have enough time for one more? Okay. Um, during the 30s. Oh, the question was what, what is at Southern University that I referenced earlier? Um, during the 1930s, the WPA sent out people to collect uh, narratives of people who had been born in slavery, so in the, been the 30s, they would have been at least in their 70s at the time, so old people. Um, and they were published from every state in the collection that we have upstairs, but for some reason, the ones that were collected in Louisiana were not. Those are at Southern University in the archives over there, those slave narratives that were collected in Louisiana. 
the, the, the Works Progress Administration, it was during the Depression. It was a government program to give jobs to people just doing things. Hmm. The yeah, WPA, yeah. Um, and there's also, there's another collection they have over there, slave narratives, that were collected by um, a dean of the university, for whom the library is named, by the way, Dean Cade. Th those collections are online sometimes. Um, they're having, they're migrating to a new server right now, so. But those are available in the library. Go in and ask, call and ask if you feel you have a connection. And those are really good sources of information because they talk, the people talk about daily life, um, and then they talk about their families, the members of their families. They name names, they name names of owners, they name names of neighbors. Um, they're really, really good sources of information. If you can find somebody in your family tree in one of those narratives, it's, it's a real gold mine, so, yeah. It's been a wonderful discussion. I think you all can agree, right? Um, at the end of it, like in, in this document right here, you will find a short survey, and we hope you take the time to fill it out for us. Um, there's a hard copy attached to this handout, but you can also go online if you don't have the time to do it now and fill that out for us. Um, I'm a part of Louisiana, the state we're in, a show that airs uh, on LPB, 7 o'clock on Fridays, and uh, we'll be doing a story about my interview with Karen and my trip down to Homa, so we'd, wonder, we'd love for you to watch it uh, at 7 o'clock on Friday, but if you don't catch it on Friday, you can catch it on Sunday at 4.30, um, and you can also catch it online at lpb.org. So we'd love for you to uh, watch it and comment. Um, now for some fun stuff before we go. A door prize. So uh, how about, Karen, you want to draw a ticket for a door prize? Everybody has it? Huh? You want to do it? Oh, you're not in it? Oh. All right. Let's see. All right. 238-480. Anybody? 238-480? I'm not going to reach in my pocket and check mine. <laughs> All right. We have the lady back here in the striped sweater. All right. Here you go. <laughs> We want to thank you again on behalf of Louisiana Public Broadcasting and the East Baton Rouge Parish Library. We want to say thank you so much for coming this evening. And please follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And watch us every time you can. Good night. With the experience and resources for cases throughout Louisiana, Walters Papillon Thomas Collins LLC is proud to support LPB, specializing in personal injury and wrongful death with information at lawbr.net.